Welcome back to another episode of Dental Practice Underwater. So normally I start these episodes out with an introduction for an interview um, led by Suzanne, our Director of Coaching. This week we are taking a little bit of a break, not for an actual reason other than uh, we had a hard time scheduling with a guest, someone had to reschedule, and we couldn't get an episode. And something I mentioned on Dental Friends with Benefits uh, last week, or I think a couple, of week, a couple weeks ago, I have never, ever missed a Friday upload. So I'm coming up on four years at Shared Practices, and never once have we not uploaded on Friday. So that puts me at almost 200 episodes in a row on a Friday. So I was not about to miss. So I, I was here in Phoenix with Matt Ford. And if you remember Matt Ford, Matt Ford is one of Richard's classmates from dental school, a 2015 grad from Midwestern. And he opened, or he has, he owns four practices in South Dakota. And so he's sort of been a wealth of knowledge for our show and someone that we've had on in the past. And so him and I were hanging out and we thought this would be a, we were having a great discussion on sort of absentee management and running multiple practices. And then we thought, okay, stop this discussion. Let's have this one on air. I need an episode for Friday, and this is going to be a good one. So I think that's enough of a preface to um, to kind of lay the foundation. So now I want to lay the foundation for the episode itself. So I think this was maybe six months ago. I was on Prax Underwater, and I talked about something that it had occurred to me for the first time. We talk about – so initially we talked about solo and group practices as if they're like two different things, right? You can go down the solo route or you can go down the group route. And then I think we've realized that we've been taking a lot of solos to groups. And it's kind of one of our coaching department specialties now is a solo to group transition is what we call it. And so it's a solo to group transition. And I think the thing that we realized is multiple practices is kind of the same way. And so I view the progression as solo practice, practicing by yourself as the only dentist, to a group practice with multiple dentists under one roof, to multiple practices. I think that is the escalating stair steps that people should take. And so I actually haven't asked Matt Ford his take on this. And so um, I want to start with that. And then I was hoping we could have a discussion of kind of that progression of taking, you know, an organization or a practice all the way from solo to group to multiple. So Matt, um, welcome to the show, man. Thanks, man. Good what to see you What a long-winded again. introduction. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm doing really good. I'm doing good. Today is the first, I know you don't know much about this, but today is like the first nice spring day after a long winter. And in the Midwest, that's like a celebratory day, like every single family is out walking their dog and like the car washes are jam full and people are ha having grill outs and stuff. So it's a big day, man. This is like what you live for in the Midwest is like the first nice sunny day after a while. I think we hit 60 today, actually. So, so I'm good. in the Midwest, really you're good. hitting 60 and you, you spend it cooped up inside recording on the shared practices podcast. So we appreciate that. <laughs> you got and um, anything you haven't you. been on practice underwater yet, right? You've been on other segments, right. but not this one. That's and right. we're not doing a traditional episode where we go de deep dive into your practice. Um, but what do you think of that take I said earlier yeah. about, you know, about the solo to group to multi? Because I don't think I've ever heard it kind of explained that way. And sort of, I forgot when it happened, but when it occurred to me, I realized like, oh, that makes a lot of sense. Like it's kind of more like a stair step approach as opposed to like a discrete, like I either do one or the other. It's like you can do, it's kind of a progression. Totally agree. And I, the funny thing is, is that everything you said, I 100% agree with. Um my path was different, and this is just a quick backstory, but from the, all I've ever known is multi-practice. From day one, I bought two practices. Now we're up to four. So I didn't get that. But I think you make a really good point in the fact that, you know, the, the type of people that, that we're kind of talking with mostly, and in, in, especially in the mastermind and the coaching departments, um, they're entrepreneurial type people. And, you know, that, that manifests in different ways and different practices. But I feel like once they hit a certain level, they kind of get to the point where like, well, what's next, you know? And th that's where I feel like multi-practice, you know, can come in um, for, for the right type of doctor. Cause you're right. You know, a, a lot of people, they have visions from the very beginning. And then as they get going, they kind of work their way through it. Um, solo to group to a large group. And then you think, okay, well, do I, you know, at some point you get to the point where you're like, do I keep on expanding and getting bigger and bigger and bigger in this one location or, you know, and maybe this is the personal question they have to ask themselves. Do they have a multi-practice itch to scratch that they, that they've been kind of, it's been something in the back of their mind for a long time. And I think, you know, people from my vintage, I'm, I'm like probably the oldest listener of shared practices being 33, but when I was graduating <laughs> 2015, 2016, me and me and Richard are the grandpas of shared practices. But 
when I graduated, it was really sexy to be a multi-practice owner. Really, really sexy. And I, I know you remember that too. I mean, that was like, yeah, that still is. I think it's D2, still a thing. D3. Yeah. And, and so it's still out there. And, and I, I do think it is a really good path, but you're right. We're see, the people that we interact with on a daily basis, you know, and you've even reached this point too, where, you know, either personally or professionally, you, you get somewhere that you think you want to be. And then you're like, well, I made it. And you know, now what? So I was actually, this is a, such a relevant conversation. I, so many ways I could take this. Um, I was on the phone, like it was what, four or five days ago with a couple of SP docs and they, they took a practice from, I think they bought it at 600 and now they're about 2 million. And that was their goal, right? $2 million practice. And I'm like, okay, that took you 14, 15 months. Now what? You know, it's like for the next 25 years, what are you going to do? You know, and I think it, you, you think it's about the, you know, you think when your practice reaches a specific size, you're going to be okay plateauing. But when you get used to the growth and how much you enjoy it, it's kind of addicting and you kind of want that growth in your life. And so that's where multi-practice can come in. And sure. so this isn't for everyone. And I want to stress that, you know, Richard has had an experience he's talked about on air and, you know, multi-practice has to be done well. This, I, I think that philosophically speaking, you know, the whole idea of owning multiple practices just for a f solely monetary reason is something that philosophically I'm just very against. You know, it's this isn't a money cash grab. This right. is something that it's a challenge you really believe in. It's something you really want to do well. It has to be something bigger than just money. And yep. so, you know, let's talk. Let's start from the beginning. Um, by the way, we we didn't really say this, so I didn't introduce you properly. So, are you? You're a pod leader with Mastermind. And right. we wanted your pod to be primarily multi-practice, but I think you have more of a group pod, correct? Yeah. Yep. That's, so far, that's how it's shaping up. But I can already tell the quality of guys we have in our pod. Those guys are so far ahead of most people that they'll be there in no time, man. Isn't it cool interacting with SP Docs? You know, like just the mindset. You can, it's, like, it's like you you cultivate this mindset and then we all talk the same, think the same. It's, it's a really cool environment in there. We, we just skipped to like step eight, you know, they already bought like the right practice. They're already doing everything for the most part correctly. So now we can like skip all the little stuff that leads up to that and like, you know, get to the meat and potatoes, which is really awesome. That's awesome, man. So let's start with, you know, I don't know. Do you want to start with a solo, like, you know, one hygienist or you want to start with like a kind of a, a two, 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 like, so it's like a solo doc doing like 1.2 to 1.5, you know, with two hygienists, two assistants, two front desk. I feel like that's the appropriate place to start this journey because, you know, we, we've talked so much about that process of going from a, a you know, a kind of a regular solo to a productive solo doing almost a million and a half. Um, right. So I feel like the story starts there because I think that's the place where our listeners are thinking about, typically if you're under a million, you're a solo thinking about a million, right? right? And then once you break a million, you're thinking about one five. And then you get to that point of like around 1.3 to 1.5 where you're like, all right, I'm maxing what I can do as a solo. And I think that's where this conversation really begins where you start to say, okay, maybe I want an associate or something like that. Yeah. So I, I, I don't know if you listened to this episode I did with Richard, where I kind of outlined the different levels of leadership, um, you know, but oh, yeah. I would, I would look at, you know, this as like someone going from, so like their steps right here, are they got to go from six employees to they got to get to an associate and they got to get to that point where they have two docs, four hygienists, four assistants, and typically three front office plus an office manager. So that's, you know, a team of, they have 14 people, including the owner, uh, 13 employees, something like that. So I think that jump, so Matt, talk about when you bought your practice, right? Wasn't yeah. it like essentially one office just run out of two locations? Isn't that kind of how it was? Yeah. You know, for me, like going back to what you said about, it's got to be something different than monetary. So I'm in rural South Dakota for the most part. Yeah. I have one practice in a bigger town, but you know, even the bigger town is still rural, but um for us, the situation I bought into was, was a little bit different because I, yeah, it was, it was pretty much one big practice split into two locations, um, about 25 minutes apart from each other. And, you know, m the reason that we're doing it and have continued um, to kind of go on the path that we're on is um, we have a little bit of a higher purpose. You know, we don't, honestly, we haven't thought about money in a really, really long time because yeah. we really like the rural, um, the rural route of, of opening practice because we, you know, it's rare in dentistry these days to get where people are legitimately just happy that you're there, you know, yeah. like they're, they're thankful that, that we're out there and they don't have to drive 45 minutes or an hour or whatever it is. So, you know, start off that discussion. That's, that's kind of our why of, 
why we've continued in, in the practice that we just bought is another one only practice in town, only practice in the entire county. Um, so is it five now? It's four now. Yeah. So the, the, that okay. one was that recently. Was the okay. Yeah. Yeah. And so like you said, I think the first step in this process is once you kind of reach that, you know, productive solo, like you said, and you bring on an associate, the first step is bringing on an associate and be able um, to kind of groom that person and, and have them maybe there a little bit when you're not there. I think that's a really mm-hmm. important first step. You hear a lot in multi-practice ownership on podcasts and whatever. And I got bored of listening to it and I, I was like, okay, whatever. But they always said, okay, you have to get your house in order before you go out yes. and you know do multiple practices. See, the problem that's, is they use such general terminology and it, it's hard to grasp what that means as a listener until you've experienced it. Agreed. And so that's why I think, you know, the, the managing the associate is a really good first step in that. Yes. Find, you know, finding, attracting talent, having them come up and come into your office and contribute to your office, the, the core value um, match and everything. I think that's a, and that's a relatively like small step into this direction because, you know, you could still stay as just a larger group practice at that point. Um, and then once you get that point down, then it's more of a philosophical discussion you have to have with yourself or, you know, your goals or whatever they are. Um, you know, for us specifically in in small town, um, I would say that you kind of, I don't want to say there's a limit here, but the, the, the patient flow isn't, you know, there's not a ton of yeah. patients around here. I mean, we live in a county of 4,000 people, so it's not like, yeah. you know, it's not 5, a ton of people. 5,000 active there. patients isn't happening, yeah. Right. <laughs> so then you have to, you have to think, okay, well, um, if you want to have a bigger impact and you know me, George, like we've talked privately about this, but impact yeah. is kind of like my thing. If mm-hmm. you want to have a bigger impact, what do you do? Well, we kind of, we kind of put feelers out to other little small towns and saying, Hey, um, this is what, this is what we do. We feel like we mesh really well with small town dentistry. And, um, I feel like it's a, it was a, the appropriate Avenue for us at the time, but you're right. I think starting with an associate, um, having an office manager that really is an office manager, I think is a really mm-hmm. important part too, because, you know, that's something that as soon as you leave, there's, I mean, the questions don't stop as soon as, you know, when you're not yeah. there on your first day that you're not there, it's not like stuff stops, doesn't, you know, stuff still breaks when you're, you're not there, you know? So someone has to be able to handle that. And that's, that's, those are the first two baby steps you could have going into multi bracket. So let's, let's talk about those baby steps in depth. And yeah. for, I mean, we could talk about the, the whys and the, the money and all that stuff. Um, the only thing I'm going to add to that discussion, cause I feel like I must have the last word on this one, um, <laughs> is that there was a study done. And they showed, statistically speaking, no uh, improved happiness past two hundred and eighty thousand dollars a year of income for a professional. And so, I think that that income is very achievable in a single office without an associate. And so, the direction past that has to be a non-monetary reason in my mind. Right. I think chasing money, st- you know, and it's funny. I I anecdotally told the reason I even know about that stat is I anecdotally told the buddy I was like, hey. Past 300k, I honestly didn't notice a difference, like in, in my life at all, you know. And um, and then he looked it up, and it was 280 was the number that kind of research had shown. <laughs> and so, um, you know, I think that again, if you choose to make the step, it has to be a, a reason bigger than you know than a monetary one. I mean, monetary right. can be a secondary or tertiary reason, but the primary reason has to be a desire for challenge, impact, something bigger. For Matt, it's impact. For me, it's the challenge, um, you know. But it's something for everyone. And so um, let's talk about, so let's just like kind of put this, you know, let's give this, if we want to give them a name, we could call this fake doc Chris or something like that. Let's just say Chris has sure. like a $1.4 million practice and yep. he's sitting there and, you know, he's like, okay, I want an associate, right? Or I want multiple practices. Maybe he's saying, I want multiple practices. Well, like you said, the baby step, and it's not even a baby step. It's kind of a major step. I that's mean, true. that's the thing. See, the reason why people say, okay. This is this is my gripe with the house in order, um, like <laughs> language is get your house in order. What does that mean? That means know. make my practice. And then uh, I've heard this before. So this is this is I'm just gonna like rip on the way that people talk about. Please this. please do more ripping on things from George is probably not a good <laughs> idea. But here it comes. So they say if you can run, I've heard this. This has been told to me. If you can run a practice with over a million dollars in collections and fifty percent overhead, then you're ready for multi practice. Oh man, yeah. Isn't that bad? Heard that too. Yeah. Isn't that horrible? Like right. that makes no sense, right? Because the it's not about the overhead, it's not about the collections, it's about the skills you gain in management and leading. And associate and office manager are the two things that you need to get down. 
And why would I try to figure them out in another location when I could do it in the location where I'm there? You know, so like the end of this step to me looks like when you can have it, when you can have many days. So let's just say you're working three days a week and your office is open five. And those two days a week where you're not there run smoothly and you have an associate in place, an office manager in place, and things are going well, then you've sort of graduated that step. And this is the first time we can, in my mind, entertain another practice as the next step. I, it's never shared like that, though. They just kind of use some general terminology of house and order and some overhead metrics. Um, so I want to go back, though, because you, you know, you're engaged to a dentist, Sarah, and you guys bought a pra- you guys bought two practices together. My yep. understanding is that you guys were the only two docs, correct? Correct. Yep. So you kind of went through this, you know, <laughs> With, without, way, without yeah. realizing it, right? So you just had two locations, but it was more or less the similar principles. So can you talk about some of the challenges that you go through? And I'll talk about them from my end of hiring your first associate and empowering an office manager to start handling a lot of the ownership level functions. So let's start with the associate. Talk about those challenges that you kind of experienced when you had hired that associate for the first time, you know, right away. Yeah. And I think to even make this story a little bit crazier. Um, so we, before we hired an associate, we got our third practice. So for about seven months, it was Sarah and I, three practices, 40 miles apart, five days a week, clinical running everything. Um, so needless to say that wasn't sustainable. And (laughs) in hindsight, would you have done it differently? Absolutely. Yeah. In hindsight, you probably would have cut back at your first two practices. Each of you cut down to three days, get a full-time associate bouncing between those two offices, and right. then buy the third practice, right? And that's right. And that and this is where I said I I I have a pet peeve about the whole like get your house in order thing too. It's well, what do you do if you know we had a really good opportunity almost get handed to us? You know, when we, we had two yeah. practices, we were we were just getting settled in our first two practices, and all of a sudden. November rolls around. This guy's like, Hey, by the way, this is, I haven't put this on the market yet, but this is exactly what you were looking for. And we're like, well, and I'm just the type of guy that's like, well, if, if there's not a really, really, really good reason why we shouldn't, then, then let's do it. You know, then let's yeah, do it. And I'm kind of on board with that too. It worked out for you, obviously, you know, you don't right. want to not be take up opportunities, but at the right. same time, you know, it, it just, it created stress. Absolutely. And it, you know, it, 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 we got through it. We don't have kids. So like we could do it, but we were dead at the end of every single day. You know, we were like yeah. the only dentist there. Um, every time we went to an office, we were putting out fires from, you know, the day before because the way the schedule worked out, they were closed the day we weren't there and blah, blah, blah. So it was, that was hard. We realized right away that we need to start looking for an associate. Um, so right away, but you did it for seven months. That's right. So we wait. So when was right away? (laughs) Right away is (laughs) we bought it in January 1st and we were like February and we said, okay, something, something. So it took you six months to find an associate. Yeah. So here's the thing about South Dakota. Um, outside of the the new grad cycle, there isn't a ton of, you know, this, there isn't a ton of dentists floating around here. That being said, you know, there, there are, now it's getting a lot better, but especially at that time too. And maybe we weren't looking hard enough or I don't know where our, our heads were honestly at that time, but we wanted, we, not only did we want someone, but we wanted someone that understands small town dentistry is maybe, maybe from the area was planning on sticking around long-term. So, you know, we wanted to get it right the first time. And so it took us probably a little bit longer than maybe it should have. Um, but we're really, really, really happy that we did. So it's funny. I'm joking, but it takes me on average four months to hire an associate. From decision to hire an associate to start date for me is in my hands about four months in yeah. a GP office. And that is, that's a, that's a process, right? Like, It's not straightforward. People think it's like, it's not hiring a hygienist. It takes a minute, you know? And um, so I just, for our listeners out there, if you're replacing an associate, if you are hiring your first associate, you try to plan a timeline, ads got to be up six months before you want them to start. Totally agree. And that's, that goes back to us. We were in February and, and we said, okay, we need an associate and it's February. And then you're like, well, best case scenario is probably going to be May or June, you know? So no matter what, we're going to have to push through for the next three or four months, right? Unless someone magically moved to town and want, you know, was already credentialed and all the crap. So that, that process, like I said, we actually found someone relatively soon, but there was just a lot of waiting game and a lot of paperwork and a lot of stuff that we had to wait for anyway. So you're right. 
if that's, you know, that should have been something that we thought about before buying, you know, actually closing on the third practice. Saying, well, and that's why I had mentioned initially, it would have been great if you had hired him for the first two. Right. Because then you would have had that six months pre the third practice and it would have been a smoother transition. And I think that's an interesting discussion too about, okay, if you want to go to multiple practice and you have an associate where you are, do you want to go and be the dentist at the new practice? Or do you want to hire someone to go be the dentist at the new practice? Like, what is your goal for multiple practice? Or do you feel like you are the dentist that can go in and grow a location and then work for a little bit and then hire another associate there? Because there's two different avenues to go there. You could, from the very beginning, you know, put an associate in a new practice when you buy it, or you could go out there yourself and kind of grow it yourself. So that's, that's interesting. Well, and I feel like this is easy, medium, and hard, right? Like easy is I just go to like you and Sarah, right? You guys had two locations and you guys are both owners and you're doing a hundred percent of the dentistry. That's the easy way. Medium is like, I'm going to, um, kind of be a little bit at both locations and I have associates at both. That's like half and half. And then hard is when you buy a practice initially and you're never step foot in there and do dentistry. And I would say that it depends on how comfortable you feel with your leadership skills, your management and your execution. And you know, if I'm buying a practice, so let me answer that question real quick. If I'm, if I'm buying a practice with me, who I am, I'm retaining the seller for two years two to three yep. years so that I don't have to find the dentist on day one. I have time to stabilize the practice and then I can sort of just sort of cash flow it for a minute, get my house in order in terms of my systems in place, like get the front office working the way I want to, get my office manager in place, get some leadership principles in place. And then like I'll have some timeline on the seller leaving. I can take my time and replace them. That's the only way I really see a very smooth, repeatable way to not be the dentist in the practice that you're acquiring. Um, but I want to take a step back because I want to talk about your, so let's go back to your story. In July, you got your associate and yep. talk about the challenges you had faced when you initially hired that associate, like them starting, you know, what were some of the the kind of the bumps in the road for you, so to speak? Yeah. I mean, I mean, if we're talking like specifics, the very first thing I can think of is that. We Did they work at all three locations or were just one? Uh, just two of them. Two of them. The two, the the two, two? that are kind of the two that are kind of one. It's, okay, I yeah. know it's confusing. Yeah, um, you know, credentialing is is honestly the uh-huh. first step because we've you know if, if you've never done it before, you've never gone yeah. through the process. If they're not credentialed, then they might as well you know really. Yeah, I mean, you can have yeah. them start, but you know, it's it's the same thing. I think I just heard on another Share Practices podcast of like. We had a week where all of our patients came in and they got a letter saying, hey, by the way, you're, you know, your new dentist is out of network. And then, every, you know, we had a thousand angry calls saying, I thought that I've been coming here my whole life. I can't believe you guys went out of network. And, both, and we're like, no, 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 no. It, it's just temporary thing. Don't worry about it. Like that, that was, that was something we had no idea about and yeah. didn't, didn't know that Delta Dental even did that. I don't know why they would, but that's a whole different discussion for another Yeah, time. we won't have that one on there. <laughs> yeah. Um, and you know, the thing is too, you know, we hired a new grad and, um, we knew that there was going to be, and she was a new grad that, um, specifically was requesting, you know, kind of in office mentorship, um, really, 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 really sweet girl. Like we love her, um, and has a really good dentist. Like luckily we found someone that's a really good dentist. Um, but we knew that we needed to be there a little bit more often. Um, and luckily for us, in this process, we've, I've found out specifically that that's what I really like. Like the, I, I get really excited on the days that I can go in, hang out with them, help them with cases, talk about non dental stuff, everything. I mean, that's, that's, what's really cool about it for me. And that's, that's, you know, kind of flashing forward a little bit, but really back then it worked out in the schedule that we were going to be there anyway. You know, we had our own column, she had her column and, you know, we kind of, indoctrinated her in the way we did things. Sarah and I both went to the exact same dental school, sat right next to each other. So we did everything almost the exact same way, like same material, same everything. So we had to kind of, you know, show her a little bit that, I mean, clinically, that wasn't real hard. I think. Diagnostically, are you guys the same, you and Sarah? Yeah. Yep. So how was onboarding this dentist? Was there like diagnosis coaching that had to happen or how how did that go? (laughs) Yeah. So, um, strangely enough, there was a, um, Productive Dentist Academy in Indianapolis um, oh, that yeah. Sarah and her flew out to. Um, 
probably about three weeks before she started. So before even the, the final contract and everything was signed, we said, Hey, look, we believe in you. We think this would be really, I mean, I think as a, before you even start ever seeing patients, this is a really, really cool thing to go to. So she went out there and that, that lowered her learning curve by tenfold. I mean, it, it's been huge for her. It's been huge for us. It's a huge, any, cause you know, what, what Bruce Baird does for you and, and what cl- courses like that do for you is just give you confidence. Really. I mean, yeah. you, you know what you're doing, you, but you need to go in there and say it confidently um, and not feel bad about diagnosing stuff. And that was a really big game changer for her. That's awesome. I'm going to just kind of share a little bit. I won't talk a whole lot about my stories, you know, cause this is more about you this episode. Um, but I, my first associate, actually, you know, her well, yeah. Um, you know, you know, who I'm talking about it's actually my second associate, my seller was my first associate, but you know, I don't yeah. really count that one. Um, and I, you know, I was so worried about the hire that I, I focused on everything except productivity, you know? And I was like, ah, the, the money part will figure itself out. And I just wanted to make sure that the team was smooth. Patients were smooth. Yeah. You know, no big issues. And yeah. what ended up happening was there was a, a, a suffer in productivity and it was a challenge that took me a while to figure out, you know, and then now every time I hire an associate, I'm much more financially conscious, you know, because the thing that you don't understand if you've never had an associate is your margins get slim pretty quick, yeah. you know, with associate led dentists, associate led practices, because they're, you know, it's just, it's not the same. You're not, you, yeah. So it's it's on both sides, right? You would just think, oh, well, I'm just paying someone else instead of doing my own dentistry. Sure. On, on the surface, yes, that is true. But in addition to that, this is a, you know, dentistry is a big fixed cost business. It's why I really harp against the overhead percentage thing. So you're going to get, not only is it going to be you're paying someone the dentistry that you're currently not paying for, they're also going to do less dentistry per patient than you are as the owner, just on average. So you're now closer to your fixed cost because you're producing collecting less with an associate dentist, you are with an owner. And then on top of that, you, you also now have to pay someone to do the dentistry. So you get hit twice, both on a lower revenue on average, and also with having to pay someone an expense you currently don't have. And so for right. those reasons, I don't think I initially understood the financial stress an associate can put on a practice. Yeah, I think that's a really good point too, because you bring up the point about you know fixed costs, almost... In, in almost every situation, you're going to have to hire at least one more person. Um, and sometimes two, you know, it, when you're making the jump to a two doctor for hygienist practice from a, from a one, two or a one, three, you know, you're adding at least one front desk person. You're adding at least one assistant, um, maybe another hygienist, you know, to be able to feed them enough exams to be able to diagnose whatever they need to diagnose. And then you're picking on a marketing expense likely. Right, exactly. And, you know, at, for us hiring new grads, again, and this hasn't been our experience, but in general, they may be a little bit less um, confident or um, to take on new procedures and kind of do higher dollar stuff. So that is something that, you know, luckily we were there and still practicing at the time that happened. But now, you know, fast forward to where we are in March 2021, um, you know, you talked about the easy, medium, hard um, we started off easy and now we just did our, this most recent acquisition was our first one of, um, buying the practice, hard. finding a doctor, putting them out there, um, and said, all right, man, here's the keys, get after it. And he's, I mean, he's going to do, he's going to crush it out there, but that is, that is a whole different level. It's a whole different level. Yeah. And so let's talk about so let's let's change gears to the office manager for a second, and then we'll get to that level. So I think right now, sure. um, you know, the office managers. This is this is something that you were kind of later to the game on, right? Yeah, big time. We had a we had a office manager, um, and he's he's putting quotes with his his fingers. <laughs> super yeah. super super nice lady. Love her. Still stay in contact with her. She was in her mid 70s. Her only granddaughter lived out of state and she said, "Hey, I'll I'll give you 6 7 months when we sell the practice and then I'm going to transition out." And I thought, "Oh, great. You know, by that time we'll have someone lined up. No big deal." And as you know, you know, fast forward from that, 4 months later we bought our third practice. We went into this whirlwind. Never got a never got around to like looking for an office manager. That lady left. Sarah and I then took on all the dentistry, all the office manager duties of all the practice. Um, and that is kind of, you know, now it has taken me a really long time to get to this point. 
um, I've started to kind of let go everything that I had to pick up when I, when that happened, because I just got so used to it. I was like in this so groove. Can we get granular days. on office yeah, manager? Let's duties. Do it. So what yes. kind of office manager duties are you referring to? Hiring, firing, Because a lot of people don't know payroll. what an office manager is. Yep. Hiring, yeah. firing, payroll. What else? Account, accounts payable. Um, so paying bills. Following up. Yep. Following up with any sort of, um, I suppose, complaints. I mean, when we have, when we have people call for, you know, we're in small towns, so we get people to call for like donations all the time or just being like the face of our practice. If they want to talk to someone, they're not going to talk to the doctor when they call in, they're going to talk yeah. to our office manager. Um, and really, I think, you know, now we're getting to the point where we're the need for us. And I know you've talked about this in other podcasts of having someone that's, um, you know, our office manager still kind of was involved in, in the day -day process of the office. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And now we're really finding the need of someone that is purely behind the scenes for all uh, four. Yeah. Or yep. like per office, one of those per yeah. office. I think for us specifically now, I think for most people, it would be one per office. I think mm -hmm. specifically because we're in rural towns and our practices are generally a little bit smaller. Um, we're kind of doing a, a little bit more of a regional manager, office manager, hybrid type thing, um, yeah. you know, because it, and it, and they're close enough where we can do that. Yeah. And hiring, firing, payroll, you know, all those things can be elevated to the regional manager level. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah and so that was something that I had a hard time giving up right away. Um, and I had to get out of my own way because, you know, as dentists, for better or for worse, we, we either are perfectionists going to dental school or we get beaten to be perfectionists in dental school. So then we think, well, I can probably do it the best. So I might as well just spend 15 minutes and like pay the electric bill or something dumb like that, you know, and, yeah. and that over time you realize that that's a really bad, you know, way to spend your time. Um, but that's just the path that we had to take because we took on a practice. Some would say, most would say too early, our third practice too early, but you know, like I said, we, we made it work. So I'm going to use a, I'm going to be like every person that uses an annoying dental analogy right now. Let's um, do it. But I think this one if will land. Do, so, go ahead. If you just do one one more crown per day. No, no, you, that's like no, okay. that's that's nails okay. on the chalkboard. Don't give me that one. <laughs> so, I'm going to I'm going to liken so let's just think of a crown, right? Yeah. So, you see the patient for a crown and you do a consent form, you take a PA and a bite wing, you do a preliminary impression, then you come in, you get them numb. You know, you prep the crown, you leave, pack some cord, maybe, maybe you pack some cord, take an impression, and then you make a temp and you, you release the patient with some post-op instructions. That is the full appointment of a crown, right? What does the dental assistant do? So the dental assistant, they will, you know, at least in my practice, they will seat the patient, they will go through the post-op, the pre-op instructions and the consent forms, they will take the PA by wing, they will do the prelim, and then they'll call you in to get the patient numb. Then you'll prep the crown, then they'll pack the cord, and then we'll take the impression together, and then they'll make the temp, get the patient the post-op instructions, and walk them out. So imagine doing that appointment without an assistant, right? So I'm going to go get the patient from the waiting room. I set them back. I do all those steps by myself. It takes a lot more of my time, but it doesn't really create a better result for the patient. It's just kind of the same exact thing. I think of office managers a lot like ownership assistants, right? So if you think about it, like, our ownership functions are we pay bills, we do payroll, we hire, we fire, we we do all these things. And they're kind of have different skill levels, right? So like seating the patient, going over a consent form and taking a couple of extras, that's pretty simple. That to me feels a lot like payroll or billables, like payables, you know, managing like kind of difficult AR situations. Those are like easy things to delegate. And so I think that when people, they ask a lot of times, how do I actually get like an empowered office manager who actually leads a team and removes my management functions. It's the same way that you delegate functions to an assistant. You do it over time, right? You teach the assistant how to do something and then they do it consistently and then you teach them something else. And every time you teach them something, that appointment gets a lot smoother. And that's how it is for running a practice. So you, you're like, okay, I'm doing payroll. Oh, like ordering supplies. Maybe I'm ordering supplies. Maybe I need to pass that off. But it's the same type of thing. You think about like I would I would suggest to everyone here, if this is a conversation that interests you, you know, go home and write down or to the office, wherever, go somewhere, and write down a list of all of the things you do to run your practice. And those are all the things that could potentially be delegated. Um, but I, I think the easiest things to start with are payroll, payables, and kind of just back end like 
paperwork, right? Like dealing with credentialing for insurance or, you know, um, like managing those third party vendors are super annoying. Like anytime I have to like remote into a server to let somebody fix local med or let someone fix my dental Intel or, you know, like install the third party, or maybe I have a call with, you know, I, I like to start an office manager, like start handling this, the stuff that doesn't deal with my staff, pretty much everything that doesn't deal with the team, but requires my time. That's like the, where I would start with trying to get an office manager in place, all of the things, you know, and then like, obviously you need back office help too. So like lab cases, notes, all of these things, like you need to start getting the stuff off your plate and um, delegating it to your team. I think you make a really good leader, leadership point too, and maybe you did inadvertently, but when you're talking about the analogy of a crown versus an office manager, a lot of times when you have an assistant, most times they have a, a background in being a dental assistant and they roughly know how to make, you know, if it's their first couple of patients they see, they know how to make it temporary, but it would be helpful yeah. if you could sit with them for maybe one or two and show them how you like it. And yeah. then they're off to the races and they're good to go. The thing is with office managers, unless you're in a place that has just a ton of office managers running around, most no. of them have no insurance or no, you know, no experience at all with it. But a lot of times as dentists, and this is something that I fell into in a really, really bad way is just saying, okay, here's what I want off my plate. See you later. You know? And it wasn't, and I found that for me specifically, that was a leadership failure on my part because yeah. th- uh, they kind of said, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll do that. And then they would come back with more questions than they left with. You know, and I said, well, then, you know, and I would get frustrated by it. And then I kind of thought to myself, well, I never really actually showed her what I wanted. Yeah. You know, I just told her, said, well, you just kind of pay the bills and handle, st-. you know, when, when someone calls up front, just kind of handle it. I don't really care. Yeah. And, and then it ended up being where every time someone called up front, you know, I, I didn't empower her enough to be able to handle stuff. So then she would have to email me and ask what I thought about the situation. And I said, well, this isn't really doing a whole lot for anybody at this point, you know? Yeah. And it, it would be the same way that if you never taught your assistant and then she took 45 minutes to make, you know, make a tent or something tenth, like yeah. that. That's not doing anything for anybody at the office. So that I was, love that in addition to the analogy. That is great. Yeah. That And that's something that I found out about two and a half years into multi-practice ownership. So if, <laughs> if, we, if, if, if we can shorten the curve for any, like one other person, I will be a really happy guy. No, that's funny. So it reminds me of, you know, my office manager. So I, so Matt, have you ever met this employee, an insurance coordinator who is very detail oriented, very introverted, who understands dental insurance incredibly well, yet has very little people skills and is very shy. Have you met that person? I think that's a lot of insurance coordinators. (laughs) So that personality, that's my office manager. And um, that's where we started. And every step of the way, like now, you know, she's a fully empowered office manager. Like I meet with her once every two weeks. She runs roughly a $3 million practice with all by herself, you know, and like that's, that's her now. But her, when I met her was exactly what I just described. And the funny thing is every step of the way, she was like, stop taking day-to-day functions off of my plate. I'm not going to have anything to do. (laughs) And now she is completely removed from the day-to-day and she's very, you know, like she's bought into the fact that like, that's a full-time job. But the funny thing is like, we started with these things, you know, we'd show her how to do payroll and she did payroll before I started, but like I tell her, pay my bills. And then I gave her an amount like $400 or less. You pay it without my approval. $400 $400 or more, you show me it and then you pay. And so then like I'd come in in the morning and there'd be like four or five bills that were all over 400 bucks. And then I sort of put my initials on all of them and I give them back to her saying they're good to pay. Right. And you kind of get a system in place. And then she does the day sheets for you. And, you know, there's like, um, you know, there's like systems in place that your office manager will do. And you kind of handle these things. And then over time you keep adding, but you give them, you don't add everything at once. You start with stuff. Okay. And you're like, how are you doing it? You audit it. You check the temp before the patient leaves. You check the bite. You make sure the margins are smooth, you know, and then you leave. And then after a while, they get dialed in. You trust them. You're like, okay, I don't need the checks anymore. It's kind of basic stuff. And then you add the next thing, you know, and for me, I, I think we should transition the conversation to hiring, firing. I think that those are, that's when like, you know, the administrative paperwork is kind of like, I think we, right. I, we've kind of covered it. Getting an office manager to hire, fire without you and hold people accountable. I think those three. Hire, fire, accountability. That is a whole nother level of trying to empower an office manager. I just wanted to ask you, what percentage of dental practices do you think have a 
that have an office manager on their staff, have an office manager that does hiring, firing, and holds their team members accountable? I would say 15% or less. I'd agree. And I, 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 when I thought about that, I think it's probably single. You're probably in the 90th percentile if you have something like that. Yeah, absolutely. And that, and that is the biggest step, but it, it requires a certain kind of person too. You know, it, it's, it's not, and it, it could probably be, probably be coach, but it, it, it does require um, someone that is at least yeah, willing. That term office manager doesn't mean anything. I almost cussed. Right. It does not mean anything. It, it really doesn't. It, it just like people use that term for everyone. You know, and a, a true office manager, in my mind, you don't earn the title until you hire, fire. With if you do hiring, firing, and all things personnel, like if I, if there's an issue with an employee, they're coming to the office manager instead of the dentist. That's yeah. when you've earned it, right? Like when you're managing staff concerns, when you're holding people accountable if they're late or if they're not doing what they're supposed to do, and if you're hiring them and firing them, all right. things personnel. That's when I view and. Like what George calls an office manager versus what our industry calls an office manager are two different things. You know, I call them office managers when they do all things personnel without the dentist. That's when, in my mind, you've earned the title of like a true office manager. Um, But everyone calls just like everyone and their grandma an office manager in an office, you know, and it it isn't really true. Um, It's like a glorified treatment coordinator is called an office manager. And that's not, that's not accurate. If you're presenting treatment to patients, you are not office manager. Right. And and I, I think too, one other cautionary tale of what not to do when looking for hiring an office manager or training an office manager. And I see this on dental Facebook groups all the time. (laughs) What not to, what, what not to do is just send them to a class that, you know, there's a couple well-known office manager only classes in the industry and hope that they learn enough in those two days to come back and, and handle everything, you know, don't, don't pay for their trip and then have them come back and be, and think that they can, well, you know, and I think the trip is a good idea. I think it's the expectations that come with the trip that are the bad. Absolutely. Idea. Absolutely. You know, they need to get the baseline level of knowledge, but they need to also be mentored and coached and supported. So, um, two I things, think, uh, go ahead. I know. I, I think support is a really good word. That's what I was just going to say. They have to be, you know, there's a whole different level of empowering someone when you are asking them to hold your people accountable and I guess their people accountable, that's a lot different level of empowerment. So you might think that you have delegated well, or you've empowered your office manager to um, make some small level decisions, or like I said, kind of handle the the stuff that comes up on day to day in the office. But the highest level of empowerment in an office is for them to take your office and treat it as theirs, you know, and that's, and I think honestly, we're still, we're still kind of looking, we're still searching for that because that is, um, that's kind of dental office manager nirvana when you get when you get to the point where they not only care about it as much as you do, um, and they're not only invested as much as you are, but they they feel like you have their back 100%. So I'm going to gonna brag about my office manager for a minute. What she started doing is she anticipates, so we do a meeting every two weeks. And I make it very clear to her that I prefer that she does not contact me between our meetings. And so... Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I don't say it in that. Actually, I say it much less nice than that. I'm like, do not contact me, please, unless it's an emergency. <laughs> and then she'll call me sometimes and I'll address the concern. And then I'll tell her, hey, like, this is not a true, con- like, you could have handled this on your own. And then I, I help her, but I always address the concern first. And um, now she's gotten to the point where she actually will anticipate a concern. So she'll say, I have a hygiene meeting coming up in two weeks. And one of the things on their issues list from Traction is this. And so I anticipate they're going to say this. So let me ask you in advance while I have you here in our two-week meeting. And then that way I'll have a pre-approval on something when it comes up in the meeting. And I'm like, yes. Or you know, she'll be like, this employee isn't going well. I'm going to try a couple more things. Do I have the go-ahead to fire them if X, Y, and Z? And I'm like, yes. Or, hey, you know, we have a temp coming in. This happened recently with a hygienist, our sixth hygienist. She was like, I have a temp coming in Monday. Um, if I like her, can I add two days of hygiene? And I said, yes. So then we sort of pre-approve these types of things now so that when they happen, she just goes and makes the decision without having to contact me. So she's starting to get to the point where she's anticipating when she'll contact me and put them in those two-week meetings that we meet for an hour every two weeks. And she'll start doing that so that I can truly operate my practice just within that one hour every two weeks. Um, But to get there, it takes a lot of support. And like she makes a ton, she's made a ton of mistakes. And it's not anything against her. It's just, that's the process of training somebody is they're going to make mistakes, but never once can you ever take away that function from them. If they, if they hire the wrong person, 
that's okay. We'll fire them and we'll hire the right person next time. No biggie. Right. That's how you learn. It takes that attitude with them so that they can feel supported and trusted and that they're believed in. They need all those things to fully take something off your plate. And personnel is the area where that comes up. For an example, let's just say a hygienist is difficult. And this is your most difficult hygienist in the office. And she is kind of having an attitude lately. And you're like, uh oh, this is going to be a difficult conversation. If I was having this conversation, it's going to be tough. My office manager is still kind of new at having these conversations with staff, but this, this hygienist needs a conversation. Am I going to let the office manager have it and see what happens? Or am I going to jump in there and have that conversation for her because I don't think she's ready for that yet? Right? So if you're really trying to empower her, you're going to let her do it. And then what if she messes it up? And the hygienist gets really pissed off and it causes an issue. Now all four hygienists or all three hygienists are mad at you. And now they're all upset. You're like, well, that didn't go well. Now what are you going to do? Are you going to go and jump in and save the day? Or are you going to further coach her behind the scenes on how to remedy the situation? Do you see now how as a listener, right? If you've never done this before, it can get very challenging very quickly to fully trust someone and believe in them as they're learning a new skill that you, if you've gotten to this point, you're probably pretty good at that kind of level one, level two leadership, holding people accountable, hiring, firing stuff. So for you, it's like, I'm really good at making the temp. I'm really good at packing the cord. I'm really good at the, kind of the harder parts of the crown. But if you could do that, it'd be really nice for me. But I don't know if I'm going to piss off the patient. I don't know if I'm willing to piss off the patient to get us there. You know, and it's that same thing with an office manager. And it, to me, it takes it takes the owner being willing to have a period of chaos to truly believe in their office manager's growth and coach them behind the scenes, fully support them behind the scenes, talk them through the discussion, how'd it go, what'd she say, what did you say, and then you break down film with them. And sometimes I'll take my office manager aside, I'll say, look, how did the conversation go? She'll say, okay, we started out talking about this, then I said this, I said, stop. This employee, she tends to move these few ways. This is a good way to attack you know, a conversation with this employee. So next time you have it, try to start there and then work your way forward. You know, and so I try to coach my office manager through having these conversations with staff so that she gets the skill and the comfort level with it. Um, an area where this came up a lot for us was was associates. So the first level is having your office manager manage associates, or sorry, manage your staff. The next level, now my office manager, she now actually the associates don't come to me, they come to her. And she'll she'll sort of deal with their concerns and she'll talk about them with compensation and all those things. And it's talking to her about, okay. This associate, you know, you got to start the conversation this way. This is how she tends to think and operate. And, you know, you kind of go through all the things. And what you're really doing behind the scenes is and I'm trying to paint a picture in detail of what supporting an office manager looks like. Yeah. It's it's very coaching your office manager through her job. It's and it's a job that you've done and you know well, so you can help her through it. That's what coaching and supporting an office manager is like. And it's standing by them when they make mistakes. Because right. there's no two-day class that'll make sure that they never make a mistake. Because right. you make mistakes as an owner, you know, and there's nobody stepping in there and doing your job. And right. so um, I, I just, I wholeheartedly agree or believe in, you know, if you're going to empower somebody and you're going to believe in somebody to be an office manager, believe in them fully. Um, don't believe in them halfway. So um, that was a lot, Matt. I mean, I'm sure you have thoughts on that. So I'm going to kind of let you break that down. <laughs> I think I was nodding like a madman when you were on that little rant and I loved it. Um, I think the only thing I'll add to that is that the trust factor in that, it kind of has to come both ways. Because to be fair to to an office manager in that position, especially if they've never been in, in a job like that or an office like this, it, it might be hard for them to believe at first that you really have their back. Like oh, yeah. that you really, that you really don't care, you know, like... And obviously there's, I mean, there's some catastrophic things that can happen in the office, but for the most part, 99.9% of the things that could happen and that could go quote unquote wrong in a dental office Ooh. that they could do honestly, isn't that big of a deal. And I think until they get to the point where they, you know, they're like, you know, cause they may just, they may, you know, it's kind of like a kid where like you say, okay, I won't, it won't I want you to try this. I won't get mad at you if, if you make a mistake or something like that, they'll kind of dip their toe in the water and be like, is he really not like. Is my job yeah. really secure? Is my job really secure if if this if this hygienist quits after this meeting? Is my job really secure? And then once you know that you have their back, and like you said, with a little bit of coaching on the side, that's when the relationship blossoms from both sides. Yeah, I love that, and I think it's 
it's a really cool thing because, you know, um, I'll, I'll, I'll use a, an example of a time that I didn't do this well. So I had, <laughs> I walked in and um, there was a meeting. I, I walked into a department meeting and there was a staff member that had a concern. And it was kind of a major concern. This wasn't like kind of something small. This was something like really core to my concerns about culture and stuff like that. And I kind of jumped over my office manager and I addressed the issue. And and I was like, I took over the conversation. I took notes and I was, and then I handled it and I had conversations with a couple people. And like, I was just like, that was just my survival mode of like, I do not want my practice to turn into this thing I'm not proud of. And like any sniff of it really got me going. And my office manager pulled me aside and she was like, you totally went behind my back there. You totally mm. undermined my authority in front of other people. Like that was not okay. And she was pretty, you know, she was to her credit and, and she was right. And she's like, you should not have done that. And I was like, you are absolutely right. I should not have done that. And I went back to those employees and I was like, I was out of line. And I said, I should not have addressed that. That was her job. And I told them like, when you have those types of issues, they go to her, not me. And right. I, I had to go kind of repair that situation. But I think it's challenging sometimes as an owner because this is maybe it's an anterior temp. Maybe it's a, uh, yeah. you know, it's like, you know, a high profile patient paying $20,000 yeah. for, you know, five through 12 anterior yep. crowns. And the temp is there is much different than a temp on number 30. But if you're telling your assistant that they're going to make all temps, they got to make all temps. Yep. And, um, you know, yeah, every once in a while I say, I'm going to step in and do this one, but like, it doesn't mean anything. Um, but like, eventually they've got to be able to do them all. And, you know, it was, um, my office manager was, was in the right there and I was, out, I was totally in the wrong. And well, I think that, go ahead. I, I, and I know you love sports analogies and so do I. Um, and I like to dump stuff down in the sports all the time. So, uh, you know, for me, that's, it's really analogous to, you know, the situation where the leadership is so high on a team where the head coach and let's say the point guard or the quarterback or whatever it is, the, the quote unquote quarterback on the court, they have a level of trust where yeah. um, it's, it, you know, he, they, there's general guidelines on how the coach wants them to play. But at the end of the day, if, if they're seeing something, you know, because they have a, I mean, yeah. it's kind of a hard pill to swallow, but they're more in tune with the office. You know, the point guard on the court is a lot more in tune with exactly what's going on on the court than maybe the, even the coaches and your office manager is maybe in more in tune with, um, you know, with what's going on in your office and you are, so you need to rely on them to be able to give you that feedback and not get offended by it. And, you know, it, it's, it's like, uh, oh gosh, I, I won't, I won't spend too much time on the sports thing, but Tom Brady is a big one of this, you know, yeah. coaches give him a lot of leeway because they trust his IQ to sort of change the play on the field without really consulting them. And, um, but anyway, to switch topics a little bit, let's kind of circle back to where we started this episode, right? Yeah. We started with the premise that it goes solo to group to multiple practices. So do yeah. you see now how, like, let's talk about briefly, because we're, we're kind of wrap up the discussion a little bit, like the, the skills it takes to run multiple practices are associate management and office manager hiring, firing, training, like all of those things we just talked about. Like, why are we even talking about associates and office managers so much in a multi-practice episode? It's because to have a successful absentee ownership location, you need a very strong office manager who is fully empowered and knows how to lead, who is, you know, you got to build a leader there and you got to build a very strong associate. And my premise and what I argue is that develop that in your own house where you know all the, like develop it on home court before you go play an away game, right? Like your practice is yeah. the, yeah. is your home field advantage where you know all the patients, you know the staff, you know the intricacies of everything. That's where you build up. Like if, like Matt and I, we're talking about all the mistakes we made. That's how we got better at this. We made mistakes we're like, oh, that doesn't work. Oh, I need this clause in my associate contract next time. Oh, I need that. Like you need to make those yep. mistakes in your own playing field. And then when you go to another practice, you'll be like, oh, I know how to like have, you know, so, so I, I mean, spoiler alert, um, I am a multi-practice owner, not something I'm going to talk about, but the the process of owning a second you know, location and owning an additional practice and owning other practices has been much easier after I got to the point of my initial office where I'm just there once every two weeks for a one hour meeting, you know, like not seeing patients anymore, not doing anything clinical. It's just running the practice with a one hour meeting every two weeks. That skill transfers incredibly well to multi-practice now 
because yeah. I, I've I've built up the leadership that it takes and the empowering of people and the knowing how to lead. So develop that skill set in your own office. Just yeah. like a group practice owner, you know, you need to get the solo kind of basics down. A multi practice owner needs to get the baseline level stuff down as well. And I think that that's really, um, I think that's, that's a way, that's a way cooler way of saying, get your house in order. Like people should rewind these last three minutes when, whenever they hear, get your house in order before you buy another practice, just listen to what George just said in the last three minutes about, um, those are the specifics about getting your house in order. Yeah. Cause it is true. You need your house in order, but like, but you're right. I think that, that doesn't mean anything. the way that the, what they say about getting your house in order, I don't agree with. Because every time somebody says that and you have them go a little bit deeper, they always say that means you have a practice that's financially successful. Right. It's like a practice that's financially successful doesn't really transfer. It, you ha- your leadership, you get your leadership in order, right? I, I think that should be the new message is like get your leadership in order, get your operational execution, your skills, your operational skills in order, your leadership in order, get your ability to run a practice in order to the level of an associate an office manager, hiring, firing, doing all things staff while you're not there and having an associate be able to be in the practice and go take a week off and see if they call you. If you can leave your practice for a week and nobody calls you and everything runs smoothly, you're ready. Until then, you you got to get your quote unquote house in order. (laughs) Totally agree. And just to wrap it up, I think you know, when people talk about multi-practice, again, not to harp on dental Facebook groups, but when you see, you know, there's a lot of people talking about those on those on those forums. The first thing that a lot of comments say are, well, you you don't want to, you know, why would you do that? You have two times the overhead and all that stuff. <laughs> and it, you're right. It's all financial. You know, the, the mind, what people are thinking about is that, well, now that you have two staffs to manage stuff and, you know, the you have two rents to pay and everything. And sure, yeah, you know, that that actually like technically those are true. facts, yes. They're not but lying. That is, that is so far down the line, like it is almost strictly a leadership challenge. Yes, it and is. If, if, yes. If you're willing to take that risk, then go for it. And that's that's the point I'm saying. If you in your first practice can run a very tight ship that you're proud of without you being directly tied to its performance and the way it operates then you are much more likely because what's the point of owning a second or third or fourth practice if you can't run them well? I mean, for me, there's no interest in that. Like these things have got to go well. And, you know, it's, it's just the way it is. And so, um, I would, I, I, my take on multi, this is the first time I've actually addressed multi in this much depth. I know. (laughs) And, um, it's an honor to have done it with Matt Ford, but again, I, I actually, I think that I do agree with the taking it slow approach here because what a lot of people might do is they might get to solo. They might get to group. Say, you know what? I'm kind of done. Like, I don't love all the staff drama. I don't love all the stuff. You know, I feel like Richard falls in this camp a bit where he was like, you know, I just don't love the, all of the headaches and the complaining that comes from staff at that level. You know, the 15 to 17 employee practice is, is kind of that, that's a, you know, you get a lot. That's, that's when you start getting the constant complaining, you know, and, and I think that um, it's like that my office manager used the analogy of whack-a-mole. It's like whack-a-mole where there's like always something to hit and it just like keeps changing. You know, that's what management is a lot of times for like those bigger practices. There's always somebody upset about something, but it just changes who you just hit it. And then the next one pops up. Um, so, you know, it's that, and that's not for everyone. And so you have the opportunity in a low risk situation in your first practice that you're going to own or you already own anyway to build up those skills. And for me, I love that challenge. I love the challenge of becoming operationally more efficient, running things with less time. And so for me, it just is a natural progression. And I've gone back and forth how many times on air? I mean, my gosh, I've flip-flopped like seven or eight times on air about multi-practice or not. And, you know, obviously now that's over, but it was, it was a thing that I really went back and forth on. And it's okay if you do too. If you go back and forth, multi, not multi, multi, not multi, multi, multi multi-single, 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 and then eventually you'll decide on one or the other, um, but I just, you know, I, I think it's important that you you learn the fundamental leadership and dental practice management skills in practice to the before you move on to a second location. You can do it, right? Matt did it. He ended up just fine, but it, your life is just going to be a lot more stressful. And for me, it's always happiness first. After two hundred and eighty thousand dollars, there is no increase in happiness. So I would make sure that I can always do multi location happily. I think that would be the criteria for doing multi-location happily. You could do multi-location successfully a lot of different ways, not not doing these things at first. But to do it happily and 
uh, and successfully, I would say you, you got to get those baseline level skills in your first office first. Agreed. And and for me, I mean, if you had interviewed my staff, let's say March of 2020, well, maybe not March 2020, that was a bad COVID year, yeah, but let's COVID. say March 2019, they would not have agreed that um, it was running efficiently and running well. I mean, yeah. there's a lot of things that we had to overcome. And now I think finally, again, after two and a half years or three years of doing this, we're finally to the point now where things are starting to hum a little bit. Um, and I'm, and it's been a lot of, a lot, a lot, a lot of leadership development on my part. And people get sick of that word, but on this, you know, if we're talking about this and we're talking about multi-practice again, I'll say it again. I said it five minutes ago. It is almost strictly a leadership thing. Yeah. And it's not leadership in the terms of like how many books you read. This isn't a right. reading no. book thing. No, this no, is no, a, no. I've, I know how to have an associate. I know how to hire an associate. I know how to manage an associate. I know how to have an office manager. These are, these are leadership development. This is like your leadership skills, right? Like, you know how to do more challenging cases if we're doing the clinical analogy, right? Like, um, but this is essentially what you're trying to do. And right. um, I, I, I think I, you've I, said it. I, I, sorry. I think you even said it on air before, but like, if that was just a reading a book thing, I'd be the world's best leader. You know, yeah. it's, it's not until you encounter the problem. You can read the book and get some advice, but it's not until you encounter the problem. And in my case, encounter the problem multiple times that you actually start to come up with real. I solutions. would agree. I think everyone has to make the mistakes. I, I, I haven't yet to meet somebody that is able to, to not make the mistakes and learn right. things. Right. Yeah. It's just part of it. So I hope you guys enjoyed this one because, you know, Prax Underwater is cool because we talk so much about these things. Uh, but, you know, this is a different lens on the same issue, right? Prax Underwater is a lot of office managers, a lot of associates for the larger practices. You know, I'm not super interested in the, uh, if you ever want to bore me, let's talk about taking a $500,000 practice to 1.1 million. Um, <laughs> that is not a discussion I want to be having a lot, um, <laughs> but that's a lot of Prax Underwater as well. So um, this is kind of advanced Prax Underwater discussion where we talk about taking that $1.5 million practice to the 2.5 and get you ready if you potentially want another location. So I hope you guys enjoyed the episode today. Matt, do you have anything you want to add um, before you before we wrap up here? I think the last thing, just going back, circling all the way back to the why for me, um, outside of you know serving the rural communities, the thing that I have found that I absolutely love is finding groups of or finding a group of doctors that I genuinely really like personally outside the office, forming a group with them. Um, you know, uh, the now the reason I love multi practice is because we get to have monthly doctor meetings and we get to text and Google chat or whatever all day about random stuff. And again, some of it's dentistry, some of it's not dentistry, but that is where like, that's, what's really keeping me going in the multi-practice space now. And that, you know, that can be achievable in a large office. Sure. But the camaraderie that we built, I think, um, in our little group here is something that's really special to me. And when you talk about impact, like that's, that's one way to have, have an impact. And that's, that's what I really like about it. Yeah. And, you know, I think it's, um, let's go back to the the money discussion to where we started, you know, it's finding, you know, I, I had this chemistry teacher in undergrad. He had this expression that stuck with me forever. It's what, do what makes your heart sing. And for the really weird group of entrepreneurial dentists that have listened to over 300 hours of the shared practices podcast, you know, the people that listening right now, maybe Matt is one of them, you know, yeah, do what makes your heart sing. And if that's never owning a multiple, another practice, then it, if, if dealing with staff and these challenges don't make your heart sing, then don't do them. But for me, this stuff is like exactly what I want to be doing all day and all night. And so that's why I do it. And Matt's the same way, you know, the, uh, the mentoring associates and, and helping them and building that family environment and impacting the community and the practice management challenges are what makes his heart sing. And so, you know, get introspective and really think about, you know, as a practice owner, as a dentist, as a person, you know, what is it that makes me happy and what do I want to be doing and do that thing. And if it's multi-practice or if it's a group practice and the things in this episode apply to you, if it doesn't, then don't do anything we just talked about because it's not going to, it's not going to, it's going to make your life worse no matter how much money you're right. making. So, um, uh, I think that's a great place to end. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode and uh, we'll see you guys next week. I'll be back on Alex and I are going to be doing intros, outros, um, for the next two weeks on Prax Underwater. So Alex and I will kick off next week's episode of Prax Underwater. So thank you guys for listening to another episode of the Shared Practices Podcast.